Hello, Kevin Clarkson here. I'm inviting you to be with us at our Pikes Peak Prophecy Summit this June 17, 18, and 19 in lovely Colorado Springs. We have a wonderful jam-packed three days for you with over 20 prophecy specialists and speakers. Let me give you a couple of three highlights that will be there on Friday night. We're going to see a premiere screening of the Samaritan. It's the true story in film of the uh, Romanian communist regime and how that came to fall by the influence of Christians there in the land. It's by director Kevin McAfee who will be with us live and in person. And then on Saturday we have Bob Cornuke with us who will be discussing his possible location for the temple that is a new site being proposed. This would change everything in the Middle East. And then finally on Sunday we wrap it up with the great rapture debate. We have a pre-trib rapture and a post-trib rapture specialist who will go head to head and we will take place. I hope you'll be there with us. It's going to be a great conference. See you there. Hello everyone. Doug Woodward here and I'm pleased to have in the studio today with me Doug Stauffer and we're going to be talking about his book and really drilling into some of the more uh, we might call them advanced questions regarding Daniel's 70th uh, or Daniel's 70 weeks and the 70th week in particular. So Doug welcome. Oh, great to be here and looking forward to another great program with you, Doug. Thank you. Um, one of the most probably uh, pivotal issues in all of Bible prophecy is the, the issue of Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. And of course, it uh, appears in Daniel chapter 9 and uh, verses 24 through 27 talks about uh, the sequencing of the different years. There's uh, a seven year period, a 60 or seven year, excuse me, seven weeks of years, 62 weeks of years, and then a final week. Um, talk a little bit about your understanding of this, the 70 weeks of Daniel overall, and then how that really fits into eschatology for a dispensationalist, someone that is premillennial, that believes and looks at uh, prophecy through from the eyes of a pre-tribulation rapture if you would well I mean that's a great starting point and really there's a lot to be said so I'm gonna I'll probably take a little bit more that's time fine. to develop it yeah um, but when I, I'm on Daniel chapter 9 of course we know that that is one of the uh, most important places for speaking on Daniel's 70 weeks because that's what it talks about mm -hmm. and a lot of people say well there's six purposes to Daniel's uh, 70 weeks I say there's seven mm -hmm because two of them are put together and when you distinguish those two number seven is really number of completion it's just it's not uh six it's mm -hmm. seven and mm -hmm. here's why it says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people well that's daniel's people daniel's people are the jews mm -hmm. and thy holy city well that's not rome that's not damascus that's jerusalem, jerusalem. so right there at the very beginning we have the context of daniel's 70th week uh, and 70 weeks is that it's the nation of Israel, it's Jerusalem, it's not the Gentiles, it's not America, it's not Russia, it is focused on the nation of Israel and Jerusalem. Here are the seven purposes. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. And let me stop there for a second. Now, mm -hmm. if, if this is the church, mm -hmm. we're already reconciled in Christ Jesus. Uh, we have the ministry of reconciliation. That is that Jesus Christ died for your sins. He, were, he was buried, he rose again. The gospel, that's the ministry of reconciliation. So when you're looking at the nation of Israel, this is before Jesus Christ uh, died on the cross of Calvary. Mm -hmm. uh, this reconciliation is a national reconciliation that's individualistic also in Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. But we're already reconciled, mm -hmm. both individually and collectively in the church, or else you're not part of the church. So I, I just think there's a huge contradiction when mm -hmm. you start placing the church in here. Mm -hmm. uh, number four, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, and to seal up the vision. And here's the one that I make a difference on. And prophecy, well, that's the sixth one. Mm -hmm. And to seal up the vision and to seal up the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So there's seven different purposes for Daniel's 70 weeks. Mm -hmm. And they all focus on the nation of Israel. And that's important to understand. Mm. Yeah, the <clears throat> of course, the, the, one of the fundamental premises of dispensational theology is the distinction between the church and Israel. And a, I guess that you would say a consistent dispensationalist 
does not allow those two programs to overlap in any way. Is that a true statement? Definitely not the programs. Yeah. Um, and I think that is the way to say it. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there are no Jews in the body of Christ? No, obviously there are. In fact, we're grafted among them. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul said the mystery in Ephesians chapter 3 is that we are made partakers with them. They're already consisting of, you know, those that have converted to Christ in the first century start up the body of Christ. The Gentiles are brought in later on. And you see that through the book of Acts when, you know, Stephen Stone, Paul's saved. Uh, he goes on his missionary journeys. He goes to the Jew first. Then he goes to the Gentiles. You see that in Acts 13, 18 and 28, mm -hmm. you know, specifically. Lo, I turn to the Gentiles, he says in each one of those chapters. And then Paul writes the next 14 books with the next 13 with his name as the first word. Mm -hmm. Basically combining those books to where uh, when you rightly divide the word of truth, you know that your major doctrine for the church is going to come from there. Mm -hmm. It's not going to come from Daniel. Mm -hmm. I don't go to Daniel and go, well, you know what? I think I'm just going to read the book of <laughs> Daniel and apply everything to the church. And forget Israel, because mm -hmm. now I'm doing what? I'm replacing Israel with a church. Mm -hmm. Replacement theology does that. Mm -hmm. We do not believe that that is a um, sound teaching. I, it's not. Right. And so that's right. why we, we, we talk against it. One of the points of, of discussion, and, and there's, there is not necessarily a standard view, be interested to know what your view is, and that is that the, the church age in dispensational teaching is concluded with the rapture of the church. Christ himself descends in the clouds. We join him in the clouds. And then we the, that are pre-tribbers, we believe that we return to heaven, the third heaven, with Christ to, to dwell with uh, Christ and the glory of the, in the glory of the Father. <coughs> but the question is, does that automatically mean that Daniel's 70th week, his final week, commences at that very moment, or could there be a gap of time between that rapture and the beginning of this final seven years, if you will, of uh, what Daniel talks about? And, and there very well could be a gap. Uh, there's no reason to believe that that's an impossibility. Uh, what I, ha I take it from another angle, too, and mm -hmm. I say, well, the church history is Israel. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, you go back and you get to Genesis 12 as quick as you can, or God gets to Genesis 12 as quick as he can. Abram's called out. Mm -hmm. You know, he is the beginnings of the nation of Israel, a called out people, a, a people that he was going to uh, uniquely use throughout history, the most hated people of, uh, ever in, in, in the history of the world uh, are the Jews. And you see them going through time uh, and they apostatize. They don't, you know, when Jesus Christ comes back, they don't even know who he is. Mm -hmm. They don't even know their Old Testament. They look at Jesus and they, they don't see the fulfillment of <coughs> prophetic scripture. Uh, much like today, people mm -hmm. don't see the fulfillment of the prophetic scripture with the pre-tribulation rapture. They had preconceived notions of what the Messiah would look like. And so when the Messiah came, he didn't fit the preconceived notions. No, they were looking for a conqueror. They were mm -hmm. looking for a king. Isaiah 61, because they didn't split verse 2 of Isaiah 61 into its two components, mm -hmm. the first and second coming, they did not recognize that distinction. Much like today, when people read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, they don't realize that that verse 3 has a three and a half year gap in it. And later on, when that wicked is destroyed by the Lord's coming, it has a three and a half year gap around verse seven or eight. So, mm -hmm. you know, people people miss that. And we have the same errors and problems happening today mm -hmm. that happened uh, in Jesus first coming. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you know, one of the things I was saying was so the church is parenthetically put in there. Mm -hmm. So you have Israel, Genesis 12, all the way through the, you know, Jesus Christ coming back. He goes to the Jews only. A Gentile woman comes to him. He says, not meat to give the children's bread to dogs. Right. I am not sent by the lost sheep of the house right. of Israel. It's Israel, Israel, Israel. Now, all of a sudden, last 2000 years, it's not Israel. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean Israel's not important. That doesn't mean that you can, you replace Israel. It doesn't mean you reject them. It means what you do 
is you realize that God has transitioned away from them and parenthetically put the church in there, we don't usurp their promises because those promises will be fulfilled in the future. There is, of course, the Paul, uh, you know, I might say wrestles. I don't think Paul would say that he wrestled. I think he would say he was very clear uh, in terms of this, uh, the issue of the, of the true Israel, spiritual Israel, uh, inheriting the promises of Abraham and so forth, which is, of course, talked about in Romans 9, 10, and 11 and so forth. Uh, the replacement theolo- theology wants to take that whole discussion of Paul from Romans 9, 10, and 11, and it wants to say, see there, I told you, we are Israel. Uh, that's what Paul teaches, clearly. We are the true Israel, and so there really is no longer a distinction between the church and the nation of Israel. There are not two programs. And so, of course, this is classically called covenantal theology, and it is very distinct from dispensational or theology. Or the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I probably... And it's a little aggressive. I might, I might not go <laughs> quite that far, uh, as I'm sure there might be a person or two I'm that sure, watches I'm this. I'm sure I fired a, I'm a sure good group of people. I'm sure you got them excited, yes. Yeah. So, uh, but, but talk a little bit about your thinking about the distinction between what Paul is, is saying in Romans uh, versus this, the, the concept of dispensationalism that, that still says, you know, there will be a day when all Israel will be saved. Well, you just quoted one of the scriptures right, of, of very right, many. Right. Uh, but I jumped over to Romans chapter 11 when you were um, mm-hmm. asking my question. When you're asking your question, it says, um, you know, again, verse 11, Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled, they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Why is God provoking them to jealousy? Because he's going to bring them back in. He's using the church today and has for 2,000 mm-hmm. years to provoke them to jealousy. He says, um, verse 17, he goes on, If some of the branches were broken off, thou being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them and with them, partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Then I won't say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. Thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the, the natural branches, take heed he spare not thee. And then he talks about mm-hmm. them coming back in. Verse 25, he talks about the mystery until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Right. Then verse 26 and 27 I think is important. <coughs> and so all Israel shall be saved. Mm-hmm. As is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverance shall turn away ungodliness from, uh, from Jacob. For this is present tense in the English or whatever mm-hmm. language. In the Greek, you know what it is? It's present tense. Yes. Uh, and you could go into a lot of other yes. words with that too. Yes. But for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. What does it say? One of, one of the seven purposes of Daniel's 70th week that I read mm-hmm. is about the ending of sins. So... Mm-hmm. This this replacement theology just is not scriptural. Mm -hmm. The nation of Israel is going to come back into prominence. And for anybody to teach otherwise is resting the scripture. Mm. Paul's clear, I believe, Mm -hmm. in the distinction between Israel and the church. The problem is in the church, there is no distinction. Mm -hmm. Only outside of a uh, group of believers would you have a distinction. Even people that say, you know, I'm a Messianic Jew. Mm -hmm. Uh, You've trusted Christ. You're in the body of Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile in the body of Christ. Yeah. They are Messianic Jews. Yes. But it's like, you know, it's like saying, uh, you know, I'm an African-American, uh, you know, mm-hmm. or I'm a Indian, uh, Indian American. What, right. Uh, right. Or, or an Hispanic Asian American. American or yeah. Asian American. Right. You know, what I like to hear <coughs> is I'm an American. Now, right. I understand why they do that, because they're proud of their heritage. Some of them. Sure. Fine. Uh, Messianic Jew, fine of his, you know, proud of his mm-hmm. heritage. That's fine. Don't let the pride go too far, though. Right, right. Let's, uh, let's just point out that um, we are having a discussion, for, really, from uh, your new book, um, Reviving the Blessed Hope of Thessalonians. And it really is the first volume of a series. And uh, this is a book that we are offering at Prophecy in the News. The book is priced at $14.95. Uh, also, we'd like to offer you a set of CDs uh, called After the Rapture. Um, done by Doug Stoffer. And uh, this by itself is 
And so the, together, there will be a discount. If you buy both, the package price will be $49.95 for both the book and the CD set. And it is a 11 CD set, 12 hours of information. And a lot of it really deals with the topics that we're talking about right now. Uh, really a lot of focus on the rapture and, uh, and then what happens after the rapture. Let's talk a bit about that. That's a good segue. What is it that specifically begins the 70th week of Daniel? What happens that kicks that sort of that time clock begins? Well, it, it, the Bible seems to say and indicate that it's the signing of, of, of the treaty, the seven year treaty. Mm-hmm. It isn't by accident. You know, you have seven year period and there's a seven year treaty. And you'd think that those two might kind might, of correspond. Yeah, and, some you way. know. And then the breaking of the treaty at the halfway point. Um, now, does that mean... It, it, I might ask, is it a treaty? Is it an agreement? Is it a covenant? Do we know specifically what the appropriate word in English is for this? And is it a... I would also ask at the same time so you can, uh, you can address both. Is it a new thing? Is it an old thing? Is it uh, sort of inaugurated at this point or is it confirmed at this point? And it, langu- and it does, and it does say confirmed. Yes. Uh, and, you know, whether that might be something historically in the past mm-hmm. that is now, um, it, it's like a lot of laws we have on the books, you know, right. that aren't enforced. Is it something that's confirmed or enforced that's already in effect prior to this time? Many, many say the Oslo Accords might be that agreement, the two-state solution and so forth, that will be a confirming, there will be a confirming event. And there Israel are warnings would. about dividing Israel, and they're going to oh, yes. divide them. Yeah, um, absolutely. So e- the, the thing is, I, I don't look at uh, even the Temple Institute that's over there, where right. they you know, they got all the things to build the temple and, you know, all right. that. The problem is, this is a covenant or a confirming of a covenant with the Antichrist. I was going to say, what, is, uh, what does Isaiah call it? He calls it a treaty with death and hell. Uh, yeah. Yes. It's, it, you know, it's not... It's not a positive thing. Right. And when you um, look at it from that perspective, it changes your thought process on what the ultimate outcome is. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not something that's uh, actually something I think God would want to happen. He's foretelling it to happen. Right. Right. But it is it is a treaty or an agreement with God's arch enemy. Yeah. Of course, uh, it is. uh, Paul is very very clear in second Thessalonians that it's at that midpoint that halfway point that that covenant is that treaty is broken by the action of the Antichrist going into the temple which he, the, that is the the language of second, of uh, the temple of God and desolating the temple he proclaims himself God do you have a, a sense of what that desolation really is is it just the proclamation as a, as a man that he claims to be greater than the god of the of the hebrews greater than the god of israel greater than the god that the christians worship do you have a sense of what that abomination of desolation is certainly jesus talked about it he said at that moment uh that will begin this time of great tribulation which usually we equate with the second half of daniel's 70th week but uh, but I'm curious, what are your thoughts on what is the, the act of abomination or desolation? Well, it does say that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. Um, mm-hmm. That act in and of itself means that he's going, if, if you come in and you say, I recognize you as God, like mm-hmm. the vicar of Christ on right. earth. You yes. know, I recognize you as God. Which happens to be antichrist, <laughs> yes. right, instead of. Yes. yes, and I, sh- I, I recognize you as God on earth. Mm-hmm. That's enough. Now, mm-hmm. whether there's, you know, an image of himself, uh, sacrifice there, uh, that might be like icing it, on the uh, cake. Say Antiochus Epiphanes, did he sacrifice a sow on the altar or right. something and like that? And it may be a repeating yeah, of that. I mean, because it history does repeat itself. Yes. One of the things I want to point out, because yeah. we use words, um, Christ himself shall descend, right? Mm-hmm. Well, when you just read that, it says showing himself mm-hmm. that he's God. Yes. In other words, he isn't God. Yeah. Uh, he's not showing the world that he's God because he's not God. Mm-hmm. He's showing himself that he's God. And I just love the peculiar wording. Yeah. It's uh, it, 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 it does 
seem like that word wording is loaded a little bit. It, it is. And, yeah. and, and God has the last laugh. Yeah. Hey, you, yeah. you're up there thinking you're showing the world you're God. Guess what? You're just showing yourself that you're God. Yeah. He's showing yeah. himself that yeah. he's God. And, uh, you know, when I read stuff like that, I just smile because I know God's in control. I know God is the one that's going to uh, laugh at their calamity, right. have them in derision. I mean, you know, these are things that when you look at them, the world, you know, even the crucifixion, you know, the mm -hmm. world says, uh, well, why would we want to worship a Jew that was crucified right. for for what? You know, why couldn't he stop that? It was God's greatest victory because mm -hmm. he made he provided himself as the payment right. for sin that man couldn't do on his own. Now, it was not an act of, of braggadocio. It was an act of shame. And yet that's kind of back to the point you were making. And then I, it made me think of the wording of Jesus where he said, you know, if I testify of myself, you know, it is not true. But there are, you know, there are two that witness, you know, the father, I believe in, in the spirit, if I'm right. not mistaken, that testify of me. And so and, and kind of that almost as if what he's inferring is that Satan has incarnated himself in the Antichrist. <coughs> Excuse me. And. It's only his testimony that he is God. Right. Is that kind of what you were sure. indicating? He, yeah. It's his testimony that he's God. The world's going to look at it and say, well, um, I believe that uh, he is God. And I think that's what the abomination of desolation is. And, you know, <laughs> you think about worldwide coverage, CNN, CBS, ABC, Fox News. They're all going to be on this thing, mm -hmm. uh, videoing it and showing it and just, you know, oh, wow, this great leader that we've been pumping up through United Nations and, you know, whatever other groups. <coughs> Boy, look at what he's done. Look at him sitting in the t Oh, look at the attire and the robe and the hat. Uh, and the, you know, the best TV ever, though, is going to be when the two witnesses are slain they lay in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days and all of a sudden they start twitching and there's this loud voice that says come up here like the shout of the command to come up and they're resurrected and they right. ascend wow that and the world's going to refuse to repent and the, re and the world will refuse to repent because God will send a strong delusion upon them despite right. the signs and wonders that God has performed here in their midst on television for all the world to see right fascinating let's talk a little bit about some of the the strange dates that we run into in the last uh, the last week of daniel there's the the 1260 or 1220 days the excuse me the 1260 days then the 2520 days we understand that the week is broken into two pieces uh, each piece is 1260 days and yet there's mentioned in daniel a 1290 day period and then a 1335 uh, day period let's talk about that first then we'll come back and talk about the 2300 days and what that infers sure the 1260 and the 1260 you know together mm -hmm. you know the 2520 um, have to do with the entirety and split mm -hmm. in half mm -hmm. so you have uh, you have three and a half years you have 42 months you have uh, 1260 days mm -hmm. and those are events that will take place either during the first half or the second half mm -hmm. and they're they're divided by the abomination of desolation that mm -hmm. is the <coughs> the, the, the midpoint the, the midpoint it? and yes. you know the, the pendulum swings from one way right. or the other um, when you go from the 1260 days to the 1290 you have events that happen after Daniel's 70th week, mm -hmm. most likely. Right. Uh, the 1335 being the same thing. That could be Matthew chapter 25, mm -hmm. uh, the judgment of the nations, can be cleansing of the temple, can be things like that right. that happen after that period of time. Mm -hmm. And what, um, what people fail to understand, though, I think, mm -hmm. is the 2300 days where that is so significant. I mean, that's something right. God <clears throat> blew me away with. Yeah, let's, uh, we, we don't have time to really kind of follow the the other because we want to talk about the 2300 days but it is uh, you know suffice it to say that many that study the scriptures connect dates of the of the Jewish feast days to these different dates and many speculate that the 1335 days you know, this is where Christ is anointed uh, in the temple and it really relates to Hanukkah and so forth um, so but let's go back and talk about the 2300 days we have about three minutes left and 
and uh, let's talk about that. Tell us what the 2300 days is and kind of the discovery that you made. Well, the uh, Daniel chapter 8 talks about the 2300 days. Mm -hmm. And it says in verse 11, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place in the sanctuary was cast down. Talks about the host, and, the, and he throws in down the truth to the ground. Verse 13, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation, which is the midway point. Mm -hmm. But the sacrifice starts before the midway point. Right. Because it has to end at the midway point, you know. Yep. I mean, it yes. has to be desolated it's, at the yes. midway point. Mm -hmm. So it goes on, it says, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot, which is Revelation chapter 11, verse mm -hmm. 2. And we know that's, the la that's, that's half of the tribulation. Right. When you put it all together and you just back it up and you say, well, the host trod under is the last <coughs> half, so back right. it up 2,300 days, and you have from a the seven... Very, from the very, from the very end, end of Daniel, back. Back up 2,300 days, and that leaves you with, seven months, with what? About seven, seven and, and a, a third, third months. Right. So there's something, there's a gap at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week that runs for about a seven and a third months and then the daily sacrifice starts begins. Yes. So what do you theorize then is happening in that seven and a third months? It can be any it can be preparation for the sacrifice, mm -hmm. uh, any part of the building of the temple. We know he's going to sit in the temple of God. Mm -hmm. So from God's perspective at the halfway point, there is something that's designated as the temple of God. So um, what you have is that seven and a, seven and a third months, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the red heifer, whatever else you want to look at, but it's the it, it, the sacrifice will start 2,300 days before the culmination the, or the, the culmination of the very end yeah. of Daniel's 70th week. That's yeah. what I see when I see the 2,300 it's a, days. It's a fascinating thing, and, and the issue of whether or not the full temple has to be rebuilt, whether it's just an altar, because we know Zerubbabel and Joshua, in effect, built an altar before the temple was fully completed, and they began the sacrifice, uh, and uh, which it was at the sepulchre, the kind of right at the outset uh, or beginning of the second temple period. So it's it's pretty fascinating in terms of of what might happen. We don't have answers to all those questions, but it's uh, it's enjoyable for us to have a chance to talk about these things. Sure, Doug. Thank you so much for being with us. It's been great to have you involved in these programs, and hopefully, we'll do a couple more soon. All right. So we thank you all for being with us today for this special program for our premier members. And we ask you, as always, to keep looking up.